Good morning. Today we're going to discuss landmark cases of the Warren Court. Uh, this is the court that was under Chief Justice Earl Warren from 1953 to 1969. Uh, so you should have already looked at some of these cases for homework. Uh, now we're just going to kind of go through them and make sure you've got the right answer. So first of all, whenever we look at a Supreme Court case, we have to understand how the Supreme Court works. The Supreme Court is based on what is called precedent. And precedent is based on the idea of stare decisis. Stare decisis means do not disturb what has already been settled. What that means is we, we don't have to keep creating new cases every single time uh, something is in question. We know the job of the Supreme Court or the judicial branch is to interpret the law. But every single time they get a case, they don't have to interpret the law, uh, especially if cases are very similar. If cases are similar or identical, we use what is called precedent. Um, precedent is based off of this idea of stare decisis, the idea that we're not going to disturb what's already been settled. Um, precedent is just how a previous case has been decided. So all future cases will be decided the same as a previous case with the same facts. Um, anytime we look at precedent, it is the new interpretation of the law. It takes immediate effect. Now technically speaking, while we're not making a new law, we're looking at how the current law is interpreted and they're supposed to go into effect immediately, right away. We'll see that that doesn't always happen, especially with the case of Brown versus the Board of Education, but that's at least what's supposed to happen. So sometimes we can talk about a court as being an activist court. Judicial activism is when a Supreme Court justice makes decisions based on their personal beliefs. So whenever they're trying to decide a uh, very controversial case, instead of deciding things based on um, sort of what the Constitution directly says. Judicial activism usually means trying to make a change, usually means trying to change the current policy. And so with the Warren Court, we're going to see that there is uh, an especially large attempt made to try to expand the civil rights of people. Um, so if we talk about judicial activism, if we want to put that on our political continuum, um, these would generally be considered radical or liberal justices, people who want a lot of change. Um, more of the conservative and reactionary justices want things to stay the way they are or go back to the good old days. So if we're talking about change, if we're talking about activism, we're talking about radicals and liberals. So let's actually take a look at some of the cases. Uh, especially the cases that deal with the rights of the accused, that is, those accused of committing a crime. So the first one we looked at was Gideon versus Wainwright in 1963. Uh, in Gideon, the legal question is, uh, there's this guy, Clarence Earl Gideon, he gets arrested at the Bay Harbor Pool Hall for, for stealing, he is then questioned, he doesn't have a lawyer, and so uh, the big question is, should the government provide a lawyer for him? He argued that he should, um, based on the Sixth Amendment, based on that Constitution, but the Florida court said no. So he eventually took his case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled, you guessed it, Clarence Earl Gideon was required to be provided with an attorney. Uh, even though it was a relatively minor crime, they ruled that the Constitution says he has the right to an attorney. So from this point forward, if you are accused of a crime, the, the court has to provide an attorney for you. That is the precedent. That is the new ruling. That's the new interpretation of the law. Next, uh, we go to Matt versus Ohio in 1961. Uh, the legal question in Matt is, is evidence seized without a warrant okay to be used in a court of law? So we know that you have to have a search warrant in order to search somebody's house. But what happens if you find stuff that was seized without a search warrant? Uh, can that be used? And of course, in the case of MAP, the police were in hot pursuit of somebody. Uh, they end up going into her home and they end up, um, they end up searching her house. And so the question is, uh, can this be used against her? Uh, can evidence be used against her? And the, the Ohio court said yes. Um, even though you've got the, the right against the legal search and seizure, under the Fourth Amendment, if you find something, it shouldn't be used against you according to the Fourth Amendment. But the Ohio court said, well, even if you find something without a warrant, it can be used against you. The eventual ruling of the Supreme Court in the MAP case uh, was what we would call the exclusionary rule. They actually agreed with MAP, not the state of Ohio. 
surprise, surprise, Ohio got it wrong. Um, Matt versus Ohio says that evidence that is collected illegally cannot be used. So if the cops search your car without your permission and without a warrant, then that evidence can't be used against you. Next, we go to Escobedo versus Illinois, 1964. Uh, in the case of Escobedo, uh, the question is, um, Escobedo is questioned without a lawyer there. And so can that evidence be used against him based on the Sixth Amendment? Now, it seems like we already settled this with Gideon um, with the idea that you have to be provided a lawyer. But with Escobedo, the question is, uh, does your lawyer have to be present while you're being questioned? And uh, the Illinois court said, well, sure, that evidence can be used against you. Who cares if you had a lawyer or not? Of course, the Supreme Court is going to disagree with that. The Supreme Court in their ruling is going to uh, say that you have a right to an attorney at any point in time, not just while you're at trial, not just while you're in front of the court, but even if you're being interrogated, even if the cops are asking you a question, you've got the right to an attorney. So once again, we're expanding the rights of the accused, expanding the rights of those accused of a crime. Which brings us to probably a more famous one, one that you're more familiar with, uh, Miranda versus Arizona in 1966. In the Miranda case, uh, once again, we've got a guy who is arrested. He's interrogated without his lawyer. This time, though, he wasn't notified of his right to an attorney. Um, if he would have asked for one, the state would have provided one. They know that they have to do that based on Escobedo. Uh, but the question in Miranda is, can he be interrogated without being informed of his right to a lawyer? And he'll claim, well, you know, I, I didn't even know that I had that right. So can evidence be used against you under the Fifth Amendment? Um, and uh, Arizona said, yeah. Arizona said, no problem. But, of course, Miranda is going to argue this, and the Supreme Court is going to agree with Miranda. The Supreme Court's ruling, the new interpretation of law, is that not only do you have the right to an attorney, but you have to be informed of your constitutional rights when you're arrested. And so that's where you get the, uh, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of law, you have the right to an attorney, blah, 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 they read you your rights, because the Miranda case says that you have to be informed of your rights before you're interrogated. Um, so, essentially, what did these four cases do? You're right, they expanded the rights of the accused. Uh, there were some other things that the Warren court did. Uh, that they, they literally heard a couple hundred cases, but looking at some of the more significant things they found, well, they were um, other key rulings of the Warren court. Uh, of course, we've looked at all the cases dealing with the rights of the accused during the term of Chief Justice Earl Warren, the Warren Court. Uh, now we're going to take a look at some of the other rights that were expanded under Chief Justice Earl Warren. First case we're going to look at is Baker versus Carr in 1962. Um, Baker versus Carr changed the way we do reapportionment or the redistricting. Uh, so we know that uh, the number of representatives you have in the House of Representatives is based on the population of your state. And uh, so what happened is uh, some states were drawing the new district lines to discriminate against African Americans, to discriminate against the poor, to discriminate pe against people from a very different background. And this is an idea known as gerrymandering. So here's how gerrymandering works. Political power in Congress is based around population. Bigger states like California and Texas are rewarded with more seats than smaller states like Rhode Island and Delaware. Since our population is constantly changing, people move, have babies, die. The Constitution requires that a census be held every 10 years to count the people of each state. Census numbers are used in the process of reapportionment to determine how many of the 435 congressional seats each state gets. As states grow in population, they get more seats and they take those seats from states that have grown less quickly. After each reapportionment, every state must alter the boundaries of their congressional districts to account for the these changes. This is called redistricting. The United States is the only advanced democracy in the world where politicians directly participate in the districting process. Why does this matter? You live in a district. Many districts actually. Congressional, state senate, assembly, city council, school. Everyone in America lives in districts. 
all districts are bounded by lines. The way district lines are drawn can determine who represents you for decades at a time. So now that you know how gerrymandering works, essentially what was happening is districts were being gerrymandered. They were being drawn in very weird, odd shapes to, again, discriminate against African Americans and discriminate against lower income Americans. Um, so, for example, if we redistrict or reapportion a district that looks like this, um, with the R's representing the Republicans and the D's representing the Democrats, um, if we start out, we've got three Republican districts and one Democrat district. Uh, now, we could redistrict if we've got to get rid of one of these. We could draw the lines like this, like this, and like this, which means the first district would be controlled by, yes, that the Republicans, the second district, the Democrats, and the third district, the Republicans. So we would have two Republican and one Democrat district. But if we took the exact same thing and we drew the lines in a different way, we could draw the lines like this, like this, and like this, and this time we'll have one, two Democrats and one Republican. So just based on the way we draw the lines, we could favor one political party or another. This is an idea known as gerrymandering. And so what Baker versus Carr said is that gerrymandering is illegal. 1962, uh, based on the idea of one person, one vote, Baker versus Carr said that uh, this would essentially take away from somebody's vote uh, take away from the ideas of equality, and so it meant that uh, gerrymandering was made illegal. Of course, gerrymandering still happens today, you just have to be a little bit more subtle about it. Uh, maybe one of the most important rulings ever decided was decided by the Warren Court, uh, maybe the most famous Supreme Court case of all time, Brown versus the Board of Education. We've already covered this in class, so we won't go over it again, um, but this said that there shouldn't be segregation in public schools or really in any public place for that matter. Another thing that the Warren Court did was ban prayer in public schools. Uh, prior to that point in time, some public schools would start their school day with a prayer. Um, Supreme Court said, can't do that anymore. The Supreme Court also banned a loyalty oath. So we talked about the 1950s, how uh, people were forced to sign loyalty oaths. Uh, for example, in the movie, Good Night and Good Luck, uh, Supreme Court said you can't make people do that anymore. Supreme Court also limited the power of the government to censor books. Um, a little bit more on that later. They also uh, said that students are allowed to protest in school as long as it doesn't disrupt the school day. And so there were a group of students who were wearing armbands, uh, black armbands, in form of protest, in a form of free speech protest. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's okay, that's free speech. You can't kick them out of school for that. Uh, some of the other things that the Supreme Court said is that you must be informed of your constitutional rights. So again, if you are accused of a crime, you have to be informed of your rights, um, even before being interrogated. Um, so once again, we follow up with that Miranda case, uh, just because it's the most famous, and here's a cute little cartoon. Um, with that said, I hope you have a wonderful day.